All right, welcome to the Golf Coach Podcast, Baden. How you going, brother? Good, Toby. How are you? Mate, I'm good. I'm really, really good. Actually, I'm really excited to kind of have you on. I've been a little bit, uh, a, little bit a little bit slack of late, and of course I've got you on. I've got, <laughs> I've got you on, the, the man that I finally met in Melbourne recently. But yeah. for people listening to this, right, you are the CEO, I guess, or co-founder of Skillist, right? Yeah, president. I'm president these days, but um, yeah, we've brought... <laughs> We brought in someone with like, you know, two decades of um, Silicon Valley experience to come in and be the adult in the room and actually be CEO. So I'm, um, yeah, the figurehead, the president, whatever you want to call this one. Hey, president, who, where did the name president come from? Uh, it's sort of like, what's the guy from Barstool Sports is um, uh, Dave Portnoy, he's El Presidente or whatever. That's, I'm sort of the, the skillist equivalent. Hey, I like it. I should call myself the president of TM Golf. Yeah, totally. There you go. <laughs> hey, and but but people obviously we'll we'll get into skills stuff, and people listening to this would know all about skills because obviously I'm promoting and I and I use the platform a lot. But why I've really got you on here, and I think a lot of people uh, who know you as well, like we all know you as you know El Presidente and uh, mm-hmm. the boss man and the man we talk to when we got questions. But you're an absolute golf nut, but golf swing nerd as well, right? Like myself, like you love. You're technique obsessed, I think, is a term that I've heard you use before. Mm. Would you would you say that's right? One hundred percent. Like, just um, yeah. I suppose like getting back to like why golf like was so appealing in the first place is that I actually started out playing other sports, um, obsessed with cricket. Like cricket, you know, cricket and golf are like this. Like, it's, it's yeah. a very hard um, sort of. Uh, to, it's always hard to figure out which is my favorite sport. That I absolutely love cricket, but. You know, swimming, skiing, whatever it was, I was just always obsessed with best practice. Like I was consumed with the idea that there was like a best way of doing things, which, you know, is always debatable and that sort of stuff. But if someone was coming down a mountain and I was sitting on a lift, I would just study the way the guy was doing it, right? And then obviously try and, you know, mirror that. Swimming in a pool, which I still love doing, every single stroke I make in the pool is very deliberate, right? Like oh, wow. I'm not just going down through the water. Like I'm literally thinking about the position, um, the twisting of my body, the sequence of my arms entering the water, the catch, the pool, all that stuff. Like I, you know, I can spend, I can do 2000 meters and not um, ever not be thinking about what I'm actually doing, if that makes sense. So, so That's when cool. I obviously was like that as a young kid, I still remember the very first golf lesson I got, um, I just turned around to the guy because I took up golf a little bit later. Like I didn't really start playing until I was about 16, 17, yeah. least, like most other pros. And uh, But I turned to the guy and said, all right, how do I do this for the rest of my life? Because I just could not get over how you could take a game that is in very uncontrolled environment, but you could bring it back to a very controlled environment at a driving range, train someone's body, um, or even just change things relatively quickly, to be perfectly honest, and mm. completely change a ball flow. Um, so I just became like, it was literally an epiphany I had, uh, with, um, that coach called Rowan Dummett. And that was, you know, that was a good 25 years ago, whatever it was. Um, and so after that, I sort of like worked hard at my game. Um, and then I sort of, yeah, moved to Queensland to go and work with who I still believe to be, you know, the greatest golf coach of all time, Gary Edward, who is the quintessential technique freak. Like his understanding of cause and effect is like, I believe, sort of to be unsurpassed. So, so yeah. yeah. So. That and, and what you touched on there as well, like it's a great mindset to have, I guess, as a coach to always be kind of assessing and understanding and learning. But if, if a player had that same mindset, it'd be extremely detrimental, wouldn't it, to their performance? Yeah, totally. Like all the things that make us good coaches are the things that make us relatively bad players, I suppose. Yeah. So um, at times anyway, obviously – you know, we can play uh, to a degree, but there's absolutely no doubt. Like I used to, <laughs> this is going to sound ridiculous, but we used to go, we were so consumed by it up at the academy. Like we would literally sit there all day on computers. We'd be filming every swing. We'd be talking about concepts, feels, and like um, cause and effect and that sort of stuff. And then we'd go and have a hit and I'd play with Gary Edwin's son, who, you know, we'll probably talk about Gary yeah. in a second, but Luke would get out there and he'd be on the second hole and he would like hit one bad shot and he goes, no, 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 I've lost it. And we'd go straight back into the academy and like work away again for like another two hours just trying to get his motion back to where he wanted it to be. It's funny as well, like, you know, that technique obsessive stuff, like I'm like that too. Like I always look for the, in anything, I always, there's always an answer, right? 
Mm. And I think that's detrimental in being a uh, being a husband too, where we're always looking for the solution and not listening yeah. as well, right? But right. I'll even I'll even watch my eldest use a fork. And I'm like, mate, your, your top hand thumb is is too long. You know, you can't you can't get your radial motion. You need to shorten your thumb up a little bit to reach your yeah. mouth. Yeah, you know, it's crazy. But all right, so you touched on there, Gary Edwin, right? So Gary Edwin is a famous Australian golf coach, and he has the swing model or the philosophy, or as you call it, the truth of the right sided golf swing. It's called right. Yeah. So before we dive into any of that, right? Mm. Can you kind of explain to us? I guess, is there any like kind of core beliefs, like principles around it Yeah, that you well, share with us? Yeah, I mean, it's all about, it's about cause and effect. And like, I suppose what, you know, Gaz has always hated and what we hate are compensations in the golf swing, right? Yeah. So what he's always done and what we've always done is we reverse engineer the golf swing, right? So we start at the finish. So impact is everything. And when people sit, talk about that, what they usually say is like, where you can get your body into uh, at impact is everything. But what we believe is impact actually dictates your starting position, right? So if you don't have the correct shape at the very start, right, if your shape doesn't fit into something resembling an impact shape, you are already during the golf swing going to be making compensations to get back into that shape. So that the very, very initial shape of the body dictates absolutely everything. So I've heard people say in the past that, you know, setup's not that important. It's about how you, what you're doing right now. Like, I yeah. believe the exact opposite. Yeah, like, it's all set up. Like, setup up literally sets the entire motion up. So, so basically, Gaz reverse engineers the golf swing where you start where you want to finish. You actually start with the correct wrist angles that you always want to have in the golf swing. So you don't start with, like, strong right hands and reverse, uh, reverse grips. You start with the correct, um, you know, wrist angles at the start. And then you can get the correct sequence and then you can go round inside an impact shape effectively, right? Yeah. And an impact shape, when you look at it, it always has a little bit of pressure in the front hip, yep. right? So everyone I've ever taught is always trying to get their hips forward at impact and they're always trying to get their top ever so slightly behind that, right? Yep. So it looks like a reverse K shape. Reverse K, yeah. It looks like a reverse K shape, exactly, right? So that reverse K shape you see everywhere in every sport. So... No, people can't quite see me right now, but like Tom yeah. Brady, when he throws, he goes like this, right? His top yes. is behind or to the right, as I'm sort of looking at it, um, of his lower half, right? When I serve a tennis ball, when I shot a put, when I throw a javelin, I always have this throwing motion. If I throw a cricket ball in from the outfield, there's a very specific shape of the body, right? So if you don't start that with that, you're always going to be chasing that throwing angle or that impact shape, which are the same thing, right? So when that happens, when you get people to do this, they always turn around and say, but where's my weight shift? Where's my, you know, because we don't believe in big turns and we I almost never talk about ground force. I never talk about, I've never yeah. talked about ground force reaction, right? Yeah. We believe that the goal swing is more from the top half. It's about, you know, your, your arm and top speed rather than about using your feet sort of thing. So... So, yeah, so, you know, if you look at, um, you know, there's still there's plenty of guys out there that sort of look a bit like this on tour at the moment. Like Tony Finau is probably more of a right sider, like even Patrick yeah. Cantlay and, like, yeah. you'll see these guys that are more upper body swingers. And even John Rahm's got a lot of, like, right-sided stuff in it where, you know, he, ta- he keeps his top and bottom in what we call the correct order the whole time, right, where he doesn't yeah. tilt the body in an, an inverted position. Um, so, so, yeah, so it just doesn't. We just don't, like, shift a lot of weight. We don't talk about huge turns. We let our arms pull us around into the turn mainly. But that turn is always happening in a consistent shape. I think for me to kind of explain it, exactly, I know exa- I know everything you're talking about. When I was, If I was to explain this to the listeners as well, is that when you talk about that lead side, you could probably say that lead leg is somewhat vertical, right, directly up from your um, your ankle line, and then you tilt your upper body. So you're, you've got more right side bend. Your spine is tilted away mm. a little bit more than mm. what you would normally see. And what you're also talking about there within the actual golf swing itself is that left hip or your lead hip, it's kind of staying against that wall there. So someone mm. would probably be familiar with this with like chipping, you know, like people talk about, you know, basic chipping, people you know, at club level, we'll talk about having 60% of weight on their lead side. 
mm. I guess maintaining that weight there throughout the chipping action mm. to kind of really help with their low point. And so to me, that's what I kind of see. And for people listening to this who are from Australia, Gary Edwin's like to name a few, like he's got Rod Pampling, what, Peter Senior, Peter Lonard, yeah. you know, these types of guys. Did, did he coach Michael Campbell? He coached, yeah, Michael Campbell, Scott Gardner, Paul Gow. Like, yeah. He's one, like his very small stable with a lot of ridicule around it, obviously, um, yeah. has won over $75 million globally. That's incredible. So, <laughs> so yeah. So there's got to be something there. It's something there. So yeah, to me, there's a lot of real benefits. So when we start, so people listening, right? You're talking about starting an impact. You're mm. probably still you're still square to the ball, though, right? You're not talking yeah. about being open to the to the target. And right. then and then within your backswing, mm. what I'll often see a lot of the time, and and I was lucky enough to work with, I think one of the best ball strikers I've ever seen is Taylor Cooper. Yeah, Taylor Cooper. For people listening, is is the most. Most underwhelming career. That guy could just absolutely yeah. stripe it out yeah. of his, you know, just come out in his pajamas, not pick up a club for six months and just shoot six under. Yeah. I've seen it. It was remarkable. And the one thing that he used to talk about a lot was that he used to own his golf swing. And Gary Edwin would talk about that, about Taylor as well. Yeah. So when you found yourself in this setup position where you're saying, we're called probably posted up a little bit in this setup and you were swinging it, is this a more repeatable action? Yeah, well, we believe so. You know, yeah. that's the thing is that, like, as soon as you remove compensation from your golf swing and when – it's really funny because I, I use that word all the time and people ask me, like, what do you mean by compensation, which is mm. for us is bizarre that you can't see compensations occurring in the golf swing, right? Yeah. But all it does is refer to – well, compensations are just things that need to occur during the motion. They're counterbalances that need to occur during the motion to get your shape back. Yeah. Right. You get your your hitting angle or your impact angle back. So you don't require reordering of the body, as we say, which you see everywhere. Right. Yeah. Justin Thomas is a perfect example. Right. Now, I'm yeah. not going to say obviously Justin Thomas is wrong what he's doing, but yeah. I would never teach what he does in yes. one billion years to never. anyone. If you actually got the average 15 marker to swing it like Justin Thomas, they'd miss it. You yeah. know what I mean? They would miss the golf ball because he is the epitome of someone who goes laterally with his hips tilts his top half a long way in front of his lower and then has to reorder everything rapidly all the way down, which is why recently hey, you know, hey, it's getting worse and worse. And while you're talking about Justin Thomas, everyone's familiar with Justin Thomas. Mm. He is the, the golfer, I kid you not, that I've spent the most amount of time studying to try and work out how it works. Yeah. Like I promise you, I've, yeah. I've worked out everyone's kind of matchups and how Ram works and how for now, like how all these guys have got it done technically wise. But every time I see Justin Thomas – High arms, zero hand depth. Yeah. I think how does he get that down to the ball? And it is remarkable. And as you say, you could never, never teach it. And when you talk about that shape at set up there, right? Mm. It's no different to the recreational golfer. We understand that when we go from an iron to a driver, what do we do, right? We adjust our setup to suit that club. So mm. People are familiar with adjusting setups to try and improve the impact position for what club they're using, right? So when, we don't believe that, though. I oh, don't of course ch- not. No, no, but not, not changing it, but people understand that that setup affects impact. Yeah. yeah. Oh, totally. You know, yeah, what I mean? yeah. but people make that adjustment with their driver without, mm. you know, without knowing. And then people ask me all the time about what's the difference between driver and iron? And I just say, well, your right foot's wider and it's going to, you know, make yeah. you increase a little bit of angle of tilt. That's all, right? It yeah. helps you increase your angle of attack mm. to more positive. So tell me about some types of like, so that's one thing, the setup position. And mm. you spoke about your wrist angles um, mm. at setup there. And I see a lot of, I used to hang out with Taylor and he would always be really focusing very hard on his grip like yeah. constantly staring at his grip, which I'm a big yeah. grip guy. You know, I've got yeah. the, the molded grip sitting here right next to me now. That I just mm. live, right? I yeah. give it to everyone. But tell me about those wrist angles. You're not talking about, you know, getting flexed and Gucci and Boeing and all that. Yeah. You're trying to keep it no, what no. we call as radial hinge as possible. Is that right? Well, we, you know, I mean, ideally there's, um, it's wristless. Like it's wristless, right? So <laughs> it should be wristless if yes. you start in the correct wrist angles, right? Okay. So at impact, like you've always got a little bit of angle in the right wrist yes. and you've got a little bit, um, 
Well, there's a, it's a little bit of extension in the left wrist, right? Yes. So believe it or not, like people talk about going like, I, I think bowing the left wrist and getting super sharp is like one of the worst things you can possibly do in golf. Right? Hard. Very so hard. And, and exactly. And if you actually like slow down, like um, Red Goat um, in Hawaii is a really, he's a great old coach. The other day, like, because everyone's talking about getting, you know, as flat as you possibly can and getting as much, um, you know, flexion in your left wrist during the, the whole golf swing, right? That's Boeing. When people yeah, Boeing, Boeing. Yeah. And then Red Goat came out and he said, well, is that actually true? Like, I mean, if you look at, you know, the US Open this year, both guys in the final group, right? So Zalatoris and um, uh, Patrick, Patrick yeah. are, both, are both like that. And they're both like that in transition. <laughs> yeah. transition right? So, but anyway, so the reality is, is like an impact, you're going to actually have a tiny bit of flexion. It's not always in, uh, sorry, uh, extension, right? It's not always going to be, I don't try to ever get anyone like that, right? So the reality is, is that if you start with a little bit of flexion like that, right? Oh, sorry, extension like that, right? A little bit of angle in your right wrist, that's it. They're your wrist angles, right? Yeah. So I don't hinge any more that way. I don't hinge any more in. I lift it. My wrist angles are the same. It's in the middle of my body. I bring it back around. Those wrist angles are the same. And then I bring it back around to this side. Those wrist angles are the same. They look like they change because of the two-dimensional, you know, um, sort of viewpoint. When you're looking at a video, it looks like you're hinging up and then hinging up, but they're actually staying the same. You're lifting your arms up, which makes it look like it's hinging. Has, but, that, um, has, has that been on 3D? Like that's – there must be some deviation within the wrist, right? Well, Take yeah, there's, probably, there's a little bit, but it's more momentum yeah. than something you're actually physically or okay. consciously really trying to do. Like, But, um, yeah, you know, it's it's not something – I most players, I would say, yeah, you never want to get too wristy ever. Like, you know, I would say you want to avoid a lot of wrist angle change, but – you can't avoid a lot of wrist angle change if you start with Dustin Johnson's wrist, yeah. right? He needs to hinge the hell out of it, right? Because this is the wrong order. You know, uh, lots of um, with your right hand way under the club and getting it sort of, you know, reversed at the start with heaps of extension in your left wrist at the start. That can't stay like that. It has to do that. Yes. But if you start with the correct wrist angles, you can be wristless effectively. Yeah. You know and, what I mean? And, and, what, and people see anomalies are everywhere, right? And like mm. I talked to Stevie Giuliano a bit about, we're dealing with a club golfer. You know, we're dealing, we're trying to deal with a majority here. Now, mm. and you were use that word compensation before. And when you're talking about lead wrist flexing and you know getting flat and Gucci, so what we talk about that is like people bowing that lead wrist. The yeah. reason why you mentioned the word compensation is because people don't people got to remember that you see the shaft move when you flex your wrist, but they don't understand what's happening to the club face. Yeah, and then if you get that club face really shut, then you better be athletically prepared to get yourself extremely open through the hitting area to mm. um to adjust with that. Would you kind of agree with that? Yeah, I mean, amongst other things, like generally, like the more shut you get, the more back you've got to go with your top to actually get the ball up mm. in the air. Like the more yeah. shut, you get, the more speed you need to actually get it anywhere airborne. Like if you don't generate much speed, right? If you you know, if you're the average golfer, the last thing you want is have no loft on it coming in because you'll never get the ball to fly properly, right? Yeah. Like I always prefer to be, Gaz used to say this, right? I'd rather be open than shut every day of the week, right? Yeah, I know. I've heard the you biggest, say that. The biggest misconception is that, like, um, when people slice it, they shut. They try and shut it in their brains. They're like, it's going over there. I need to shut it, right? I need to stop. I need to hood the club to stop it going right. Now, guess what happens when that happens? They open the hell out of it on the way down because they can't get this up in the air. Yeah. So the shut it, the more you shut it, the more you cut it, right? Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I wrote an article in golf.com, you know, last year that says, you know, if you're slicing it, get the face more open, right? Because if it's open, you can shut it, right? Yeah. So you want to be going round, you know, like Hogan, you know, didn't like try and shut it. If you look at Hogan, Hogan talked about going around as hard as he could with his top like this, right? Yeah. And never hooking it. Now, if the face is shut and you try to go around with your top, guess where it's going? It's going dead left, I'll right? Push back up. Yeah. So if your face is neutral to slightly open, and keeping in mind you can still hit a draw with an open face as long as it's left of the par, right? Yes. You know, so you can still hit draws with an open face, right? Yes. So, so when, yeah, what Baden said then, right, is that like, yeah, and, and a lot of the time what people are talking about with club face stuff, what you're saying is people see a slice and they shut the club face, yeah. where it can be counterintuitive because – 
um, and what you're talking about potentially opening the face, uh, it can actually encourage you to try and help close that club face through the hitting area. So, and and I, I heard, I remember the first time I ever heard that where the coach was talking about he had a guy who kept being open at impact. It was his son. And he kept closing it up, closing it up, closing it up. And, he, and then he got some more advice and someone said, well, hang on, if you actually get that club face more open at the top of impact, yeah. at top of the backswing, mm. then potentially that he can actually just say, release the club more through the hitting area right. and, and actually hit the draw where mm. instead you've got him shut, you've got him being backing up and trying to, um, trying to get that thing back to square and he's actually reversing it. You know, he's, he's compensating that way there. So a lot of the time what you're saying is fixing a slice is not necessarily just shutting the club face down in the backswing. No, it's the worst. I, you know, it's more often than not, it's a, it's a steep path, you know, like you yeah. can fix your path and like, um, and look, the face influences it obviously, right? But if you're bringing the club around with an open face and it's towing up like that, like towing up like a tennis racket with top spin, yeah. right? That's how you stop the the slice, yeah. right? It's when yeah. people come in with a you know a slightly steep uh, steep um, initial change of direction on the way down, hold their arms this way, and it goes out to the right, and they don't fix any of the par stuff or the way you know we would say the body more than likely is influencing the steep path um, yeah. without fixing the body and without fixing the path and all that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, you'll still slice it. it just by shutting the face is is a, it's a band aid that actually makes things worse. Yeah. And so a lot of the time when and those wrist angles and your um, spine angle go mm -hmm. hand in hand that you've set up at the address position because mm -hmm. what you're talking about the body causing a slice of people listening when Baden was saying at the start that the spine would tilt in the opposite direction. Yeah. That's where we'll see when they start tilting it the other way where it's negative, not away from the flag, we'll yeah. start to see a path created or swing direction to the left, right? And yep. then, and then that's that compensation we see. So if you can, if you can one keep your shape with your body, two keep your wrist angles in a nice steady position, and mm. you get to release it, you, you're pretty much off to the races. Would you be saying to kind of run a checkpoint there for people listening that if they were to say do a well, your golf swing is like a half finish, you could probably say it's Fleetwoodish, is when your right arm gets to parallel to the uh to the ground in the follow through position are you trying to see like it all just completely rolled over and the, the toe of the club looking high what 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 does what does that look like yeah it's all it's symmetrical like it's perfectly symmetrical right so if my arms which i don't know this is probably it doesn't make it's on great. youtube too people want to listen in yeah right so this is the goal swing toes right yeah. look at that yeah. Right? Yeah, so yeah. this is my back swing yes left arm over right all right, now I'm in a hitting position, right? Everyone what needs to be this way to make a ball go that way. You don't want to be this way. No. Right. <laughs> no. Right. no. Okay. No. And then the through swing is this and this. Look. Yeah. Right? So it's basically what it is is rolled over. It's, it's, it's actually a little bit of an optical illusion, right? So when I'm here, right, it looks like my right hand is obviously on top and I go like that. This looks like a flip to a degree. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it looks like a rollover, but the reality is it's actually exactly the same. Do you yes. know what I mean? Yes, no, so I agree. This looks like a rollover, but it's just staying in the middle of my body as my body turns out and back around yeah. the middle of um, or around that impact position the whole time. All right, let's. Does that make sense? Did it, that no, answer? no, no. It does. It does make a lot of sense, but uh, it does make a lot of sense, and it's it's. Um, I talk about the illusion as well in regards to that kind of release there with that mm. with that form. So people. You know, what I'm going to do as well is I'm going to put a post up on Instagram for people listening of a right-sided um, golf swing and just like I did with mm. Nelly Corder the other night. Tell me now, right, all right, so we, we've gotten through spine tilt, wrist angles, and a bit of um, structure work. Tell yeah. me now about, I know you and I have had this discussion before and you've had a discussion with Foles. Tell me about this. So we see lots of Instagram myths, flex lead riffs, get Gucci, get open, and we see – ground forces, people jumping around like they're in a fucking circus. Yep. Tell me tell me about, obviously there's no ground forces in Edwin Golf, right? Well, there's no conscious ones anyway. Yes. You know, yeah. Like there's no conscious ones. So if we you put us on a map, like you, it would say, 
that there's, you know, some sort of ground force happening, but it's driven from almost, it's driven from the top down, right? So the top is pulling the lower and the and the feet into a position, if that makes sense. So I'm trying to generate all my force from here toes, right? Yeah. So from in here and in here, right? I don't use, believe, oh, this is going to sound crazy, I've never taught anyone to spin their hips on the way down to hit it, you know what I mean? And I've never taught anyone to like rotate, uh, jump out of their right foot. Vertical forces and rotation don't go together very well. They do if you're trying to be the long drive champion of the world because what it does is create all of these counteractive torques which can create a lot of stored energy in the golf club but all they do is change the shape of the body and make it very hard to bring the club from the right direction on a consistent path and it's hard to keep it in the middle of your body right so you know i've told people to clear their top halves before right so their left shoulder needs to go around like this a lot more on the way through but i'm I don't think I've ever said to anyone, you've got to snap your hips as hard as you can on the way down or even at all, to be perfectly honest. So the lower body um, force and any ground force reaction that's occurring is occurring because the arms and top half are swinging at a fast speed and pulling, as Peter Thompson said, weight shifts itself. Right? Yes, okay. Weight shifts itself, especially if you're turning in the right direction. That's the thing, right? So people that get stuck on your right foot on the way down, and more often than not, you've turned in the wrong direction on the way back, so you need to go backwards on the way down, uh, or you just don't you don't turn this way, right? So when you're turning this way, like um, as we do, so we go out and back, we turn what people would say is more sort of level to the ground almost. It's yeah. never level because obviously you're over with the body, right? But when you're turning more level, like a discus thrower never thinks about shifting his weight. Do you know what I mean? That, sh- that weight is shifting, yeah. right? Yeah. You know, and all of their top half, their top half is going around and they get pulled way over onto their front foot, but it's because it's very rotational. It's out and back like this, right? As soon as something gets a little bit up and down, it makes it harder to go forward and around. So, so talking, these are the things that... Yeah, you know, you're talking more centred, people listening there, you, when Baden's making these movements in front of me, like a centred mm-hmm. spiral. I guess is yeah. the word to use, Pete Cowan, like centeredness, and yeah. and that is kind of that that is causing, um, you know, as you spiral, you can yeah. automatically feel if you're standing there, you can automatically feel where your weight's moving, right? Yeah, exactly. And, weight goes around; it shouldn't go up and down. I wouldn't ever yeah. suggest. So, uh, so why why are we seeing instruction out there that's talking about, you know, a lot of ground? Do you think it's just counterintuitive to the recreate? Like it's it's more damaging to the recreational golfer to be worrying about the ground when they should be just getting their head around contact? Um, well, this is where it starts getting, like, you know, controversial, obviously, because being, like, the founder of Skillist, we are sort of swing agnostic. And, yes. like, you know, it's, you know, I'm, I'm, I want everyone to be on our platform. And I love – there's some of that ground force stuff I look at and go, I can see why that is important to them. And I think it's, you know, it's cool uh, because – they're obsessed with speed and distance, you know what I mean, and, like, just trying to hit it as far as you can. But the reality is, right, Toby, you don't need an unbelievable skill set to play golf, I would say. Yeah. Right? Like, people think that you need to be this freak of nature and hit two irons that fly. All you need to do is be able to have a relatively good bad shot, right? So when you hit a really good shit shot, it's still pretty good, right? Yeah. You're still okay. And yet, if you can generate enough force to bunt it down the middle, if you can hit your drive at 240 meters, you can play off scratch probably. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like you don't need all of these things. The, the sad thing is we're looking at like long distance and what Bryson is doing. It's crazy. And we think that that should filter down to people that play off 18. It's like it, it's insanity. It's crazy. Oh, I, I agree with you, Baden. And I say the same thing. I like, Don't get me wrong. I deal with a lot of top top players where we're trying to get the extra percentage out of them. So like, yep. they might be, you know, college golfers and, you know, they, they want to make a career out of golf. And I think you do have to be able to hit at 300. Otherwise, you can't make money. Yeah. I think that's, yeah. a, that's a forgiven rule, right? But I don't yeah. think people – playing club golf need to worry about hitting at 300 but what i say to people all the time is that you know i've shot 10 under i've shot eight under numerous times with a seven iron going 150 yards max yeah and and most times um, students will send me their reports through online like their track man reports or their quad reports i go i say to them your best six iron today 
was better than mine. Yeah. So my job is to try and harness that mm. and make that happen more often. I don't need you jumping out of the ground to try and hit that 10 yards further. No Let, way. Let's, let's talk about what's a priority, which is clean contact, you know what I yeah. mean? Yeah. And I think well, I played I played golf with Alex Clapp the other like about six weeks ago or eight right. weeks ago when I was in London, right? Well, we played like four holes. We got absolutely <laughs> it's done. Yeah. 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 But Clappy, oh my god, like he crushes it. Like yeah. but it doesn't even look that powerful. And I said, "Wow, that's pretty crazy." Like he was literally at times like he hit a couple past me that probably went like forty yards past me, sort of thing. Yeah, but, you know that doesn't bother. I've never cared about that, you know. But he's like particularly long, and. I said, oh, have you always hit it like that? He's like, oh, no, no, it's like only really since I've been working on this ground floor stuff. And I was like, oh, yeah. And I was like, are you a better golfer? He goes, no, I'm a much worse golfer. <laughs> <laughs> like, I hit it further, but I'm a much worse golfer than I used to be sort of thing. Yeah, so, like, well, what are we doing here? Like, what is the, you know, what's the point sort of thing? Um, but, you know, I mean, Clappy would also be able to like rein it in and play really, really good golf. You know what I mean? Sort of thing. So I think uh, it's, yeah. And, and, and I think lastly on that kind of ground stuff is I, I think you're either a, um, like I talk about this with some of my players, right. And I'm, I don't teach specific kind of methods, but I definitely have certain parameters and rules that I like. Right. Mm. I see some people are really good, say linear. So, so like they are really like good lateral, like they might shift, like say a Rory and get like, you know, pelvis is moving off the ball, pelvis moving through the ball really well. And then other players who just are just spiraling, let's just say, use the word spiral and they just pivot really well on a center pivot. And I have other guys, you know, that, that have an excessive amount of knee flex, you know, so there's different types of ways that people, I guess, generate energy and move their body to kind of suit them as well. So I'm not going to tell my center pivot, Nick, in the UK to start jumping around out of the ground because it's just not going to be beneficial to him. He's a five handicap golfer. I just don't think it's really – I think he's going to go backwards too much, mm. you know. So Yeah. I, uh, yeah, totally. Look, you know, I just um, – yeah, I think what we tr- what we should be trying to give people is like a really good baseline, right? So what I say to my students all the time is like, okay, if you hit ten shots in front of me, your top line isn't going to be that far away from mine. Yeah, probably. you know what I mean. Say that every day. <laughs> your baseline is going to be miles away from my baseline, yeah. and that is what makes me better than you. Not my top line, right? So yeah, you know, you're going to hit a seven iron here if I just let you rip as rip them as hard as you can. That sort of looks like my best seven iron, but the one that you know you shank out of bounds over there, and the one you take a fat divot with, and then the one you your blade that shoots along the ground. I haven't hit one of those in five years. You yeah, know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. So yeah. that's the difference, right? We're trying to build something for people that is like super manageable. They can play in any wind conditions because they have real ball control. Like control their golf ball. They're not there just trying to play. Whack the crap out of it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, no, no, I agree. I agree. And and I say to everyone, like, um, you didn't, you booked in a lesson, not because your good ones is is you know good. You didn't book because it's good. It's because your shit one's so shit. You know oh. the reason why you're seeing me is to improve your shit one. And yeah. to tell you right now, we're going to be getting rid of some of those compensations to try and you know yeah. to try and neutralize a little bit there so lastly oh, lastly on right. this right sided swing right before right. we shift yeah. into uh the superstar business that you've got is oh. i want to talk about tell me about you know i mentioned it in my talk down in melbourne about how i think a lot of technology has kind of brought swing philosophies closer together so when right. i see when i say swing philosophies of people listening to this i would say people would have heard of stack and tilt mm. um what else is there Let, let's call it the right side that one there and more ads let's say Ma, um max stuff as well it's kind of brought them closer together what mm. was it like for you early on being i guess having that outlier looking golf swing. So for people watching this, I will put it on my Instagram page or listening to this because when I was first in it, I was a naive young golf pro and I would give Taylor, I'd give him crap. I'd work with him and he'd be doing all this funky stuff in the shop and he'd be looking like he's, you know, doing all this stuff, like he's washing the dishes with his arms and it'd be all quite bananas. What was it like going to golf tournaments or playing or or having that? Um, Yeah, I mean, 
Like, you were definitely at pubs getting arguments with people. Like, that's the thing. <laughs> like, it was more at the pub, like, that you would get in, in an argument and go, you know, bloody know what you're talking about. But that's when back when you, like, um, that's back when you actually thought that having those arguments were going to actually do anything. Like, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> that person's always going to believe what they believe and I'm always going to believe what I believe, right? So yeah. you sort of relatively, well, that probably took me a decade to get out of that. You know, I've been doing this stuff for 20 years. Yeah. And, um, you know, so it was sort of, but I mean, you also, like, we were, I suppose the thing is, is that when you sit down and you listen to Gary speak and you actually spend time with him and you actually see the nuance and, like, the sophistication mm-hmm. and the cause and effect and the way he fixes goldsmith, you sort of sit there and go, well, of course this is the, like, this is just so clearly the right way to do things and, like, yeah. this is the way I would see it. Obviously, it's, you know, the, the funny thing is, is that I hold two totally different belief systems in my head. One of them mm-hmm. is... I would never, if you said to me I couldn't teach right side and stuff, I wouldn't even be a golf coach, right? Yeah. Like I'd be off doing something else, I guarantee you, right? Which is yeah. crazy. To, but at the same time, I totally believe that other people are doing good things and like other people like, um, you know, there's, it's not right for everyone. It's definitely not right for everyone because people's brains can't deal with not doing lots of stuff in the golf swing, yeah. you know what I mean? So, But, yeah, I mean, look, when we're at the academy, and, like, you'd be standing there and Gow, Lonard, Pampling, Gardner, Campbell, like, Coles, yeah. seven U.S. tour players were flying in from America, right, and they'd come in and spend four weeks and they'd be sending it out. Like, it doesn't take much for you to sit there and go, oh, I think this is pretty good, this stuff. You know what I mean? A guy yeah. up who's living in Mudry Bar who does no self-promotion and do no, does nothing had seven guys playing on the U.S. tour at one stage. I, 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 yeah, and I think as well, like, you know, when people, you know, he's got a, he's a smart dude, obviously, right? But yeah. when he's, you're, he's a savant, he's like, he's a bit of a savant. And I know that sounds crazy, but he's a savant. Yeah. So, but when, yeah. but when you're, when you're putting the emphasis like he has on impact and he's just built, you know, he's put some parameters in place on how things have got to work to get to that impact, which he thinks is ideal. Fuck, it's can't it can't go wrong, you know. Like it can't go wrong in regards to when he's gearing everything towards that one position where he's so mm. familiar with. Where a lot of coaches out there aren't even talking about impact, you know. No. They talk they're yeah. way at the top of the backswing and not looking at what's going on at impact. No, exactly right. So, but you know what's funny is that like people say that oh, you ride side as you'll swing it the same way, but that's if you literally in the in the broad sense of absolutely no model whatsoever. Or any attention to detail, we swing it the same way. But Lonard was too shut. Pampling was too open. Senior was way too hinged. And, you know, we haven't even talked about Pete Senior, who, like, has played the best golf of his life yes. after meeting Gary. Yes. Um, you know, so there's everyone, if you look at all the right side, it's go, holy shit, they all swing it completely differently. But people would still say we swing it the same, like, because... There's so many variations, even within something you might call a tight model. There's like a billion universes, even within that universe. Does that make sense? Yeah, so- no, I agree. And and the more that you you kind of look at it, and I, I um was talking to um Stevie Giuliano about this, which about his method, right? Well, you know, he's built a system, a systems. I think the word yeah. that he likes to use, and that he says in a box with tight lines, and you know, you're teaching out of a studio, and you've got all your lines. Things do look the same. He spoke about Andreas Carly. But then when you go out outside, all of a sudden everyone looks different when they're playing, you know, like they're playing yeah, mode right. because people like to move the, move it differently and, and just kind of right. move differently. But all right. It comes down to your attention to detail yeah. a little bit. You know what I mean? Like it's so easy to go, oh, they all swing it the same way. It's like, are you serious? Are you watching very yeah. closely? <laughs> I've actually played a bit of golf with Peter Lonard a bit actually because he, oh. he was um, – I was did my trainingship at Eleanor Country Club. And he used to come yeah, play there right. a bit with our shots. Right. We should be doing trainership at Eleanora. Yeah. Oh yeah. my god, what a great place to do it. I know, a little country kid doing an Eleanora Country Club, and I had to. Oh wait. my god, I love that joint. That's like one of my favorite golfing experiences playing around there. Like I, I was there every day, all day. I'd sit in the. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd. I used to work just three full days, and every other four days, I was there hitting balls from dawn to dusk and chipping yeah, and And uh, Peter and I, I got to play with him a few times, and um, really nice guy. Yeah. Cool. Just loves playing golf. Just loves playing golf. Yeah, yeah. He's got an incredible story, like obviously with Ross River Fever. And yeah. Like, yeah, just uh, – but, I mean, what a ball striker. Like at one stage, 
think Tiger said he was the best ball striker in the world at once in 1997. Wow. Yeah, yeah, I was so nervous the first time I played with him because he was like, uh, you know, he was part of that group of heroes when um, yeah. I was growing up, you know? Yeah, totally. Like, Me too. I got to play with Paz a fair bit as well, so which was which was always fun. But yeah, yeah. already, let me just kind of let's let's just shift gears a bit here, right? So, I understand that from what I've heard that Gary Edwin was doing online coaching back in the day. Yeah, just a little bit. I mean, this is obvious. Yeah, sort of. I suppose getting into skills. Yeah, that's where that's it shit. Oh, yeah. So, that's where so did he influence you at all in that in that respect? Oh my god! Like a hundred percent. Like in two thousand and two. Like yeah, he was doing. He was doing online lessons all week sort of thing. So, like, people would email their video that would be grainy and horrible and filmed on VHS and, like, somehow they would manage to get it onto their computer, then somehow cut it up into enough pieces to send it to Gary to then be able to put it into V1 that he would then, you know, um, do an analysis and breakdown, cut it all up, somehow put it back into the email. But, you know, there was no PayPal. There wasn't even online banking at this stage or anything like that. So there was no real way to pay you know, for the services or without sending, like, literally cash through the mail. Like, that's how, you know, you'd be doing it. Um, and I just couldn't get over, like, even from that very early age. I still remember, like, this guy from Holland was obsessed with sending his swing. And I was like, wow, that just shows you that if the coach has got the right IP, if they believe that that information is what they want, people will do anything for it. And it just made me very aware that your mentor – isn't necessarily the girl or the guy that works at the driving range, which is like within five k's of you. They yeah. could be literally on the other side of the earth, and it, and so that was obviously like Luke Edwin Gary's son is a he's a bit more of an entrepreneur than what um than Gaz is, which you know wouldn't be hard because Gaz you know doesn't want to build much of a business; he just wants to fix golf swings. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Like Luke, we used to talk about the monkeys would be sitting out the back doing online lessons. We'll get thirty guys and all the. Or 30 monkeys just punching out online lessons all day, yeah. sort of, yeah. you know, sitting out the back. And that was sort of like, that was where we started thinking about it. That never sort of eventuated. I mean, the technology was never there. Like, yeah. It's way too hard. To it's do, too hard. Yeah. 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 So, so then, so then what happened from there? So what happened, uh, so with me, I suppose, like I was then, so yeah, I mean, I shadow Gary nonstop every day. They called me a rain driver. Like I literally was. <laughs> That's a bin chicken, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was a bin chicken, like at the driving range. And I literally, I worked at the Glades. So I actually worked at the golf course that I was, you know, working with Gary at. And I used to have my, like, <laughs> My walkie-talkie because I'd be like outside outside service manager or like ah uh, yeah yeah and I'd just get busted all the time when I was supposed to be working I was just up watching Gaz give lessons you know what I mean yeah, like you know yeah. just, as a twenty three year old or whatever just mucking around so anyway I just shadowed Gaz for like four or five years so two thousand five yeah I think at the end of two thousand and five after move oh two thousand six sorry two thousand six after being up there for four and a half years or whatever I moved to London teaching in London. Um, yeah, had a great time over there, obviously, and just was teaching at Central London Golf Centre in Tootingbeck, which is in the south of the city. And um, then I got an invite from Gaz's Academy to go and work at um, in Singapore and work at the Right Side at Academy in, in Singapore, okay. Pete, Senior, Pete Senior Academy in Singapore. So I did that, but it was um, I was I hadn't done my traineeship at this stage, right? And I was ah. sort of like, uh, I was like, geez, if I really want to. Um, if I want to get the best jobs in the world, I better go home and do my time. So that's what I did. I sort of went home in, you know, uh, God, 2008, started my tra traineeship in 2009, finished that in 2000, uh, sorry, uh, 2011 or whatever it was, or 12, 11. Yeah, it's probably been, I've been out for 11 years or something. Um, and then, but it was sort of like the fact that I was traveling around the world and I just wanted to build something more worldly than just my profile and even you know what I was about and I also wanted to solve all of these problems that you know um I discovered as teaching like because we teach such a specific way and we're very detailed in what we do people have to work at it you know what I mean it takes time mm -hmm. you've got to chip away and you've got to stand in front of mirrors and train your body to work the right way and do all that stuff but that was never going to happen with the way the old industry worked which was come for a one hour lesson I'll see you in four weeks like yeah. just you literally you would maybe help eight percent of people like the other you know 92 percent of people they sort of disappear 
you know, they don't actually have any documentation of what the lesson was or what they the analysis was or what model they're working towards. And then, like, they go out there two weeks later and try and hit a golf ball based on what they remember they were taught to do a week and a half ago and it doesn't work. And then they have a terrible experience. Most students will say, oh, yeah, I tried golf lessons, but it doesn't work. And it's not that it doesn't work. The process doesn't work. But the model yeah. of the way we actually get people to get better doesn't work. So... So we just, I brought all that stuff together effectively. I was like, we've got to like bring mentors and coaches together from across the world. We've got to take this thing online. We've got to give them a better way to learn more consistency, more interactions more often. It's got to be subscription based. Um, and we've got to make coaches more money for what they're worth. Like they're only making, you were on stage the other day and, you know, uh, you're up there with um, Mike from yeah. Golf Genius and he was saying that, the average golf teaching pro in America makes thirty five thousand dollars. Yeah, it's like it's just it's insanity, incredible. you know. So, and but it, but that is because the model is so broken. Like, yeah. if it was easier for coaches and students to interact more often, if the if it worked more often because you had a better way to interact with your coach, students would go more. You know what I mean? But um, but they don't because like yeah, the way it's all set up is broken. So anyway, we I was teaching one of my students, and then one day. Uh, he was out in the parking lot in an Aston Martin, right? Oh, nice. And I was like, what the hell do you do? This guy, his name is Alan Gow. Ah. He's like, oh, I'm a software developer, right? And I go, oh, really? I was like, that's amazing. I was like, well, I want to do some work. I want to build something, right? So anyway, he was actually coming at the same problem I was from the student point of view. He's like, I want to learn from people around the world. Like, why do I have to learn from you? Like, why can't I learn from Sean Foley? Why can't I learn from... Yeah. Hey, Katie, why can't I learn from someone else out there that might have really good information? So anyway, we started building software and like we, he was pretty incredible because we actually, we had this other business partner at the time who pulled out pretty quickly because we went and got a, um, a, a quote to build out something, right? And the quote was for the plan, right? This was for like a UX and UI plan, not a line of code. The plan was going to cost $35,000, right? Mm-hmm. Just for like put something down. So anyway, the one business partner we have was like, I'm out. Like, I can't afford this. This isn't going to work. Yeah. And Alan said, don't worry, I'll build it. And Alan just started building the platform essentially. So, so yeah, that was seven years ago sort of thing. And now um, we are. So what, what, yeah. And then what Skillist is, is a uh, online coaching platform. So what, what you've done is you've given access to um, anyone around the world can get a lesson from anyone around the world. Yeah, That's exactly right. Exactly. Yeah, and, and use it more often, and um, yeah. you know, in a more succinct, shorter, consumable kind of way. And and I guess as well, like what you've done is, it's kind of like a dating app where yeah. you've 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 got people, you know, like oh, like some people are like I really like. Let's say, for instance, I don't know. Let's use Alex Riggs in Dubai. It's like, oh, geez, I'd love to go see Alex. You know, but he's in Dubai. You know, what I, mean? yeah. I love his method. I love the way he talks. I want to yeah. see him. But now, now you can. Now you yeah. can. And and you can. Yeah. And, and it's getting better and better and better. The experience of it. And why you were saying that the online coaching is, um, you know, use that number there, eight percent and ninety two percent or whatever, eight percent of people are getting better in person, is because ideally. Ideally, right, if someone could come see you twice a week, right, in person for an hour, you know, that would that would only leave each pro to like 20 students, right, max, maybe 10, yeah. twice a week, which would cost you an absolute fortune. It would yeah. be like 40 grand, 20 grand a year or something. Oh, yeah. Then it would be achievable, right? But what we're saying is people are getting that same experience like with myself for like 200 USD a month. You know mm. what I mean? So, but I would, all, yeah. I would also almost argue though that I don't even know if that two hours is the best way to learn potentially. Like, how many times have you given someone a lesson in person and you're like, after five minutes, you're like, you just need to work at that a little oh. bit. Like, no, you know no. what I mean? Like, you don't need to stand here for another 55 minutes. And that was like getting back to Gary. Yeah. If you go and see Gary now, he almost says nothing. You can spend an hour with him and he's just like, you just got to do a bit of this, like do a bit of that. Like yeah. you don't spend the, it's not this like, you know, diatribe of information that goes on for hours and hours. It's like, just think about it this way and just focus on this and just drill that in. And that's, yeah. 
And, and, and I agree with you. I say the same thing with my students who, you know, if a student does come to me, right, with all my students from online to in-person, right, is that everyone has an understanding of their DNA pattern and I guess their yeah. major swing floor, right? Let's just use that term. Yeah. And we're always working towards a, like a systematic approach to try and get them out of that. Yeah. So we're managing it. It's kind of like managing an injury. Right, where it's that same thing. So when someone comes in to see me through online, everyone's generally working on one to two specific things. And what I say to people about my online students, whenever I have a new Zoom call, like I had had just a Zoom call today with one of my subscribers from America, and the call we start, we're straight into it. And he knows exactly what we're working on. And I, I would like to hope that every single one of my students who are seeing me online could tell you in two lines exactly what they're working on and why yeah. and and what what it should look like and you go down the street and you ask someone someone comes to me for a lesson or you know an online lesson and they they can talk for 20 minutes about the shit they're working on and i go yeah. jesus christ mate i go do you know from the start of your goal swing to the point of impact is 1.1 seconds and you just yeah. told me for 20 fucking minutes what you're working on yeah. I say, how about this is your DNA issue. We need to do this, this, this to get out of it. It's the only way we can make changes because, mm. you know, I had a call with my guy from New York just before you and I said to him, he goes, what about this? What about that? What about this? And I said, yeah, it's not all perfect, but guess what? We can't do it all at once. Yeah. Okay. Totally. Yeah. yeah. I couldn't agree more. I could not agree more. It's just got to be – like I think there's there is a place for big deep conceptual conversations like what we had probably just before like yeah what right side and stuff is and you can go deep into it and you know but the reality is it's like what what's the most important thing for you to know right now like as a student and like integrating that and taking your time and just checking in and just like checking in's everything like really you if you you're trying to make a relatively big swim change. Like you need to like the next day speak to Toby and say, yeah. is this what you mean? Like yeah. I, am I on the right track? Am I on the right track? And Toby just giving a thumbs up or a thumbs down should almost be, that's yeah. the lesson. Yeah, keep doing more of that. Just keep doing more of that. Or no, just modify it this way and just clarify. But as you said, like it really is you become like you're a physio retraining someone's body to do something, you know, different over time. And that just takes time and strength and, um, you know, just uh, – Repeatability, I suppose. So it's definitely, yeah, we both agree that it's it's definitely the best way to learn, right? Totally. Well, and, you know, even you showed that really cool clip with the VR stuff. Yes. You know, it's only, it's only going to get more that way. Like people aren't, people will, yeah, and this is the funny thing. I remember when I was on the, um, uh, I was on the Me and My Golf podcast, right? And we were talking, Piers and Andy said to me, like, what's the future there? Like, what's this yeah. exactly going to look like? And I'm like, oh, it's going to be like, VR and it's going to be on your phone and like you'll be interacting and like and Piers said something which uh, was interesting which he said oh this is a shame right because this is going to be like less less you know human and less where what happened to the relationship stuff and I was like this is the biggest relationship stuff yeah. like this is going you're going to be interacting with people thousand times more than you used to like yeah. the old ones aren't real relationships you see yeah. someone for an hour and then they disappear for a month this yeah. is like as you said, Toby, and it's what um, Alex Moore said to me once, which I'll never forget. He's like, look, the way I look at it, Baden, is that I've got 60 subscribers and they're just 60 best mates. I just play golf a shitload better than they do. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah, I like and, that. And, that's, and he's just managing and because he's just got these great relationships with like 60 guys that he loves working with. And the relationship's yeah. better and it's only going to get more that way. So from – yeah, and I agree. And everyone on here knows all about it. So from an app point of view, like we're obviously, you know, we're working closely or, you know, rubbing shoulders with Golf Plus VR, which is a virtual reality goggles. And, you know, right. I've been doing some playing lessons inside there, which I spoke about at Melbourne Expo, which is just Burko, right? Mm, but, totally. And we're starting to deal with, um, you know, we're starting to see apps coming out that have got 3D you know, which is really helping all our coaching as well. In regards to, I guess, the communication side of things as well, yeah. where, where where do you see, like what's going to be, what's next for online coaching? So right now it's an analysis. We send instructional videos back. We have 24-7 support. Like in the yeah. big picture, right, let's just say like 20, 30 years, is it just going to be like the VR? Is that it? Yeah, totally. 
Oh my god, 100%. It's going to be, and that's what Meta talks about now when Zuckerberg is talking about like the future of um, the metaverse is that the first use case is unequivocally training. It's like going to be training is like the first thing that really takes off in VR, yeah. right? So um, there's absolutely no doubt in the future. Look, there's going to be what we've just discussed is that like it doesn't have to be synchronous for it to be really powerful learning. Like you can do an analysis and people can consume it in their own time. You can leave voice messages. So there's always going to be probably an element of like it'll be through your phone because, um, you know, it's just so easy. You know, you're not always going to want to have a headset on. There's no doubt about that. I do agree with that. Yeah. But it's going to be a case of like a lot of asynchronous stuff through your phone and a little bit of synchronous stuff through Zooms and stuff. But 100%, like you'll just be able to throw this on for a couple of hours mm. a day and you'll like you'll train, you'll play practice rounds with people, you'll actually be able to have a really clear visual of their body and even semi be able to move them around in some way, like yeah. be able to show the way their body needs to feel. And, yeah, it's absolutely going to be tough. You'll just have like that, that facility in your background will just be like, more and more fancy and like have more and more cameras and like yeah, it's... more of these headsets and you'll be playing rounds of golf with guys and mentoring people from around the world and you'll probably do very little in real and, life. And the majority of people listening to this right now is like, like they're still thinking no way, but we've, yeah. we've been in the conversations, we've been in the meetings, you know, we've seen what it's like and we've also seen the powerful way. And if, I guess let's just kind of go back to, affordability as well of online coaching because we're not giving so much time to each person. So they yep. like to go into the VR, same sense, right? That evolution, it's the same evolution. Like you come see me or you for an hour in person, it's quite a lot of money, right? Where mm. you can get more and more information and touch points through online coaching. And the same thing will happen with VR where you'll get more hands on less time and, and it'll, it'll be a cheaper cost. Totally. Couldn't agree more. And, yeah. yeah. It's just like, it's going to be like, I'm, you know, I'm doing a presentation at the Top 100 mm-hmm. uh, Coaching Summit next week in Phoenix, right, um, yeah. for golf.com. Yeah, it's awesome. And I'm just going to get up there and go, this is the golden age. Like what's about to occur over the next five years to ten years of coaching, coaches are never going to be able to, like coaches are going to make more money than they've ever been able to make. Students are going to get better. Like it's going to be this incredible era and it's all going to be tech enabled, right? And it's just a really, really exciting are you time. Just, are you going to get like full Rick Sessenhouse on it and just get like full <laughs> into it? I'm not going to get that. I won't get that. I don't think I'm going to walk around the stage like giving it these ones or anything. All right. Probably... So I've got two more questions for you. One more question for you is yep. I guess from a, um, I guess from a, a question, like a personal question from myself is that, you know, I've, I just got a, a couple of corporate phone calls this morning as well. And, you know, I've had a call with a guy in Ireland. I've had a call with a guy in New York. And I've got some really cool things happening behind closed doors, like with, um, you know, YouTube channel going off and the podcast is going really well. Like people say to me all the time, like, um, you know, you, you know, you're doing a good thing. Like things are going well for you, Toby. And I just go, you know what, like I can three years ago, I was, you know, I was in a pro shop selling Mars bars at 5.45 in the morning and fucking throwing printers at the glass window, right? Crankiness, yeah. getting paid 10 bucks an hour or something. But for me, right, like I've had to, I've just kept saying yes my whole life, right? Like yeah. since that last three years and just working it out once I get in there, like, yes, let's just fucking work it out, you know? Let's go to Bali for a few months and let's just work it out, you know? Or let's sign up to VR and let's just see what happens, you know? And just kind yeah. of paving your way through it. And it gets a bit nerve wracking as well. How have you, from like the business point of view, kind of, you know, you started Skillist and just you're finding yourself in uncharted territory from, I guess, a personal standpoint of view as well. How have you dealt with it? Yeah. Um, uh, like I suppose like on an uh, intellectual side of things, like how have I gone from like just a golf pro to someone who's like now, you know, raising capital from, you know, mm. UC, Berkeley, UC Berkeley um, over in California. Um, and obviously having incredible connections with uh, the Australian startup scene who have then introduced us to some of the best angel investors in Silicon Valley. And like, that's just been like a wild ride. There's no doubt about yeah. it. And obviously like you're a bit of an imposter at times, but <laughs> the one thing I've done like absolutely voraciously is consume podcasts, right? Yeah, okay. So 
I would listen to three a day almost. Like wow. when I'm exercising in the car, whatever I'm like doing work, I will have like stuff going around venture capital, around tech, around like um, that's all I listen to is like media, tech, uh, venture capital, um, fundraising, you know, trends, you know, uh, stuff like that. And that's really helped. Like that helps me go into a room and just be able to talk the talk and, you know, use the lingo and stuff like that. So that's been huge. And just um, and just going for it as well. Like we went to San Francisco a couple of years ago to go into an accelerator. So we were literally in the heart of Silicon Valley in a, uh, well, it was actually in San Francisco, not Silicon Valley. But, you know, doing an accelerator, I'm sitting there with guys that have come from Facebook and like stuff mm. like that. I was a golf pro, right? So <laughs> all of that stuff was like, you know, very, very fast. And then the other side of it is obviously just the stress, you know what I mean, yeah. at all, the, the handling the stress. And that I probably haven't done a very good job of. Yeah. I've just been stressed. You yeah. know, like, it's just like, because we, to get something like this airborne, like I actually had a phone call with a guy the other day who he um, he's a former Olympic ice skater and he wanted to know what ha- what has it been like? How have you built this thing? And like, because he wanted to do it, he's like, I could, I reckon I could do this. It sounds pretty straightforward, like, you know, building an online coaching marketplace. And like, by the time I was sort of done with him, he's like, this is, sounds like an absolute bloody nightmare. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, and um, to get this thing, like, even remotely moving has taken every fiber of our being as a company, like, to to get it to where it is. And we feel like we're only now at the starting line. So yeah. Um, during that period, haven't been overly good at managing my my stress and like sleeping properly and like yeah. you know when I'm, I'm look I look at the phone way too much and my iPad and like on the computer way too much and it's uh but that's been a challenge but hopefully uh, I'm getting fitter again which is great so um so yeah hopefully I'll, and it's I'll it's also a lot of that kind of the fear of the unknown and and when and when you're so passionate about something as well like you're just constantly thinking about it and you just got to. Oh, stop yourself thinking about it which is impossible you know it's, like, it's so hard that's, that's like sometimes i do say to nicole my partner is like i wish i could just like for a day like not have it like just for a day yeah. like you know because there's no doubt since the first line of code we put down there hasn't been you know nick she took a photo of me the other day right and she said this is your skillest face and i was literally sitting there like this <laughs> <laughs> right, I was like, because I just like mid conversation, I can just like go off yeah, and, like, not even thinking and not be present. So being present's been the hardest. Hey, thing. on that on that startup thing, right? I remember listening to a thing on Airbnb when it first started, and the guy started it and. He was getting so frustrated that people weren't getting their listings sorted, so he went around yeah. to like ten properties and just took the photos for them. Yeah, like what you do with the coaches, and just yep. and just took the photos from them. Just got started, you know. It took years yep. to get moving out, and same with Uber. Stayed in the yeah. same town for ages before it got moving yeah. out. All right. So that's, you know, that's all understandable those, is the way you answered those questions. Tell me lastly, yeah. right, this is one I didn't prep you on anything. Oh, I haven't prepped you on anything, actually. We just got on the call 10 minutes late. Tell me, yeah. if you were to play a round of golf, I want to know your mm-hmm. three playing partners, but they can't be golfers. Uh, Not allowed to be a golfer. All right. Oh, God, this is really – I'm always terrible at these things. Can't be a golfer. No. Uh, Michael Phelps yes. would probably be one. Yes. Right. Or actually maybe – yeah, let's say Michael Phelps. Right? Yes. I'd love to do something with Michael Phelps. There's a triathlete called Lionel Sanders that I think is just like hilarious and just like a bit of a neurotic nut about everything that he does. That would be great. Maybe so. But maybe I'm getting a bit too sporty. Um, but then, yeah, there's a guy called, oh, this is going to sound all crazy. There's a guy called Mark Benioff. Mark Benioff started Salesforce, which is like this huge CRM, um, software company. Yes. Right? And Mark is a brilliant guy because everything he has done, he doesn't talk about shareholders. He talks about stakeholders, right? Mm-hmm. So he talks about stakeholder return while he's building his company and his stakeholders are the city of San Francisco, the homeless people that he walks past every day. And he's just built this unbelievable business which gives so much back to um, the, to society, I suppose. And he's, it's a very con- – he calls it conscious capitalism. Mm. You know what I mean? So, so, yeah, I reckon Mark Benioff. So let's say those three guys. That, yes. is, that is pretty broad. That is pretty broad. Yeah, hey, I, I, I never knew that you were so into swimming. 
Oh, yeah, I'm obsessed. Love it. You're obsessed? That's, is that, is that because you're seven foot two? Like, <laughs> I'm not quite that big. I'm six three. But, like, <laughs> um, but it was one of the greatest things that mum and dad ever did for me. They forced me to go to swimming school from like, you know, four through to like 12 and I, I've just been able to hold on to that skill and love it. And the last thing actually on that swimming now, you just raised it again before I let you go. We've both got a lot to do. But mm. the – the swimmers, what about a lot of the swimmers that I, I listen to podcasts, especially Howie Games and whatnot, like he's he's a, he's, a, he's a gun, right? You hear a lot of swimmers talking about that kind of that white line fever after swimming, the competitive swimmers, about always swimming and seeing that line. There's yeah. a lot of people who have got mentally unstable after their swimming careers. Yeah. Well, swimming in particular, like it is like it's almost like a um, monk state. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like – you have to get up every day. Like even if you watch elite triathletes, they're sort of similar. But like, you know, for um, swimming, like you get up at 4 o'clock every morning, you're at the pool by 4.45, yep. you do like a 7K set, yeah. right, which, you know, is just insane. Burko. Then they, you know, go eat, sleep. Then they do another 7K set in the afternoon, go eat, sleep. And then you wake up and do it the next day. And like you're doing 14, 15 Ks a day. And if you take, imagine doing that for your entire life from the age of like seven through to like 26 and then it goes like, yep. you would be like, what the hell am I doing? Hey. Like I could totally imagine that happening. Oh, too. mate. And you know what? And I've, I've heard the numbers that they do when they get up early, right? It's, it's crazy. School kids as well, like doing these stupid yeah. amounts of kilometers like just by That's themselves. You definitely don't want your kids to end up as swimmers because you'll be up at four forty-five. Oh, exactly, but but also like like for me from a coach's perspective, right? Looking at that from performance level, I think to myself, if I'm if I'm coaching someone, say like a Michael Phelps to swim hundred meters, hmm. is it right practice for him to be doing seven k's? Like like you saying Bolt's not doing seven k's. You saying Bolt's running hundred yeah. meters. Well, it depends on, exactly, it depends on your event. Obviously, like, if you're doing 50 or 100, but Phelps wasn't a 100 swimmer. Like, he did swim in the relays, yes. the 100, yes. right? But he was a 400 swimmer, a 200 butterfly. Yes. He was an individual medley guy, so that's a 400-meter swim. So as soon as you get out to 400 meters, like, absolutely, you've got to be doing 7 k. He actually holds, like, the world record for the longest putt, I think, or something. You said that putt at the... At the open, whatever it was, um, whatever it was called, yeah. it was Burko. It was unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, he loved it. He loves his goal. He tried to do that thing with Hank Haney, who was Didn't destroying him during that, that Haney project or whatever. Oh, we won't go into that. We don't like to do that. Yeah, stuff. Yeah. Hey, exactly. Baden, I appreciate you coming on. I'm going to go have some lunch. Um, yeah. You do that, too. Mate, as, as, and I think it's really good. Like a lot of coaches listen to this, we get to talk about skillist, we get to talk about your golf swing. And I think people, yeah. you know, need to know and get to learn about Baden, the golf swing nerd, you know? Yeah. Well, that's good. Yeah. Because I try and obviously keep it to myself a little bit because that's the one thing I just don't want any coach to think that, as I said, I, t I hold two totally different belief systems in my head that what I'm doing when I teach is 100% the only way to do it. But I also know, and I'm smart enough to know that there is no one truth. Well, right? I know. And I know. You've told me that numerous times. If I've opened my mouth yeah. and been a bit cheeky about something on social media I don't like, and you've always, you've always defended every coach, I've always uh, maybe maybe questioned. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that's the thing. Everyone's got their own way of doing it. And everyone's on their own journey as well. Like I'm still on a journey of discovery. And, you know, something that you believe to be true you know, or I did 10 years ago, maybe I don't now. Oh, so getting angry, no. getting angry at someone for something they believe, which is probably just a process of discovery, yes. is like a bit ridiculous. Though, yes, anyway. I think getting angry, yes, is a, is a bad word. But I think what they say, if you, if you don't change every five years, then you're not actually learning. <laughs> you're, no, you're actually exactly. just staying staunch in your own beliefs. So, yeah. All right, thanks, totally. brother. I'll talk to you soon. All right, mate. See you soon. See you,